Greetings, everybody. This is Slim from Frolona Farm. This presentation is meant to demonstrate how we're using QGIS for conservation and restoration agroecology. So as a quick preview, long story short, we're using QGIS for all phases of our projects. Uh, we're using it in research and assessment by being able to access and download existing data from third parties um, there's a lot of research and analysis tools and processes within QGIS itself, and we're also able to collect our own data and import that into QGIS as well. Um, in our plans and modeling, we can develop burn plans, we can develop um, and identify sensitive sites, extreme management zones, plans for harvest and basic management and um, access, all kinds of stuff like that. We can even, even take some spatial modeling data from programs like Synchrosim and import those model results into our uh, QGIS and review uh, plans before we even enact them. And finally, reviewing an evaluation to again, inform our plans and decision-making process. So things like post-burn evaluations and ongoing vegetation surveys to see how our actions are affecting the landscape. So in our research and assessment phase, um, you know, we can download existing data from third parties um, with our area of interest file that we can make in QGIS. We can go to third-party sites like Web Soil Survey. Here's our area of interest there. Or Land Fire, same thing. And we can download that data right into QGIS. So we have our Web Soil Survey soil map. And uh, we can enter the data from the soil reports right into our attribute table so that in QGIS we can display the soil ratings that we want for whatever we're trying to figure out. Here what's displaying currently is the tree mortality ratings so that we'll know where to plant our trees more densely in you know, silver pasture projects, for example. Uh, some of the land fire data that we are using, which is pretty cool, um, First, for historical vegetation, we have the biophysical settings layer, which shows us the presumed historical vegetation. We can, uh, we can also generate roster files from, this is our elevation layer, and we can use the roster extraction contour to generate elevation files. And it's like basically a topo map that we're used to seeing. And we can do the same thing with the slope layer, for example, to do some different symbology. Uh, and so we can have multiple layers that display slightly differently. Here's some existing vegetation with elevation and slope overlaid with the soils. That's a little confusing, but I'm just demonstrating some of the things we can do with all that um, data that's already out there. Uh, some cool features include uh, querying databases from in QGIS, so you can stay in the app. This is a cool feature, Quick OSM, where we can query open source maps uh, to get things in here like our streams. So I did that to generate some of what's on our waterways layer. So to get Cruise Creek in here, we did an OSM query and also added some of my own data for some of these smaller streams that aren't on the OSM map. Uh, and finally, for a little more weirder things, you can import NatureServe, for example, NatureServe uh, VegBank data for some of their research plots. We could if we wanted to find out where they are and go visit them and compare their, you know, these uh, plant communities here with what we're seeing at our place at uh, good old Frolona Farm. So that's just a few examples of how we are using it currently and how we plan on using it in the future. 
Uh, next, we'll move on to uh, some of the research and processing tools. And QGIS has a lot of research and analysis and processing tools available within the app application itself. Uh, whether it's vector data, roster data, um, you can install plugins for specific things. With Python, you can write your own processes. There's a field calculator to make new fields with uh, specific calculations in them, and a processing toolbox with even more things. Just so as a basic, real basic example, what we wanted to do is create our uh, Woody Stem plot locations, our Woody Stem sample plot locations. So we wanted areas of interest that had Woody Stems, so we we created a new shape file for our woodland areas. We then used the, um, with that file extent, we used the research tools to create regular points and uh, a localized coordinate reference system so we could make one point every 208 feet and uh, generate one sample plot per acre and then using the vector geoprocessing clip tool we could clip that um, points layer with the area of interest that we want and we generate this pretty nifty gridded points only in the woodlands uh, with the field processing, with the field calculator, we generated latitude and longitude fields for each of those points. And that's in our attribute table right here. Latitude, longitude. And then we exported that layer as a CSV file uh, at a pretty standard coordinate reference system. And that CSV file, we then um, assigned names, uh, numbers, to each one of these plots uh, systematically, you know, sequentially. Uh, and then we uploaded that to our uh, Fulcrum app that we are using to collect data in the field so that on our mobile device out in the field, we can navigate directly to a point, open that record, and begin collecting data right into the app where it'll be saved. With those Latin longs, we can re-import that data into QGIS later for further analysis. So that's just one example of how we're using some of those real basic research tools. There's a lot more that can be done, a lot more that we will be doing moving ahead in the future. Uh, so moving on to some other examples. So I pulled in some preliminary data to give an example. Um, here is our crop trial area. <clears throat> and we have the green dots uh, are just, these are made in Onyx directly in the field and just imported that KML file to get started. And I took my notes and entered them into the attribute table. So we have a name. Uh, cultivar height, branches, leaves, and the condition rating for every pawpaw tree that's in that orchard. And so we can add new points as we expand that orchard and collect that data, collect different data. Did the same thing for the annual crop area. I'll have to zoom in for this one. Since we're trialing garlic, the plant spacing is pretty close, but we have these lines that represent each bed. And I did a Q chainage run for plant spacing so that we have a layer that has a point for every plant. And that will translate to a line for every plant. And we, can, we will create columns for every piece of data we want to collect for each plant. And we'll be doing the crop trial data collection that way uh, for Stuff that's a little more complex, we can go visit our uh, vegetation survey. So what we've got right now is um, 
we do have some data collection for the first uh, few sample plots for our vegetation surveys. These are our basal area data that is displaying at our sample plots where we took the measurements. And we can also display uh, the mast and legacy tree data here. So we're taking diameter measurements from the healthy and mature mast trees. So we've got oaks and hickories represented here in the data itself. There are some pines, the bigger longleaf pines for the legacy tree data. But we have species and DBH uh, recorded, and we're using those as basically anchor points to go out and do the work we need to do for our mast, uh, managing those woodlands for mast production, thinning those woodlands out for that sunlight to get optimal mast production in those woodlands as well as um, biodiversity in the understory. So uh, that's how some of the data is informing what we'll be doing and how we're using the QGIS to really get a good idea for each area that we'll be treating uh, what we're going to be what we're going to be looking at. We've also got the good old iNaturalist data and um, this is mainly for species inventory and uh, the plot, the, uh, the locations of those observations so that we can uh, just do a good job keeping track, getting some of our peers in the broader ecological community um, on uh, iNaturalist to help us with these IDs, confirm them, deny them, update them, and re-import them so that we know where they're at and we can continue to refine that data. We're using these as basically references. Uh, and <clears throat> that comes with all the data that's in iNaturalist too. So if we want to pull some things out, we've got photos, uh, we've got agreements, we've got location accuracies, uh, lat longs, all kinds of stuff, taxonomic information. So I uh, went a little over time on these, but uh, there's a lot more of that stuff that we'll be using for um, water samples, soil samples, pretty much the same way with these points, lines, and polygons and uh, attribute tables that can be exported as CSV. We can use those CSV files in modeling information. I'm getting a little ahead myself, so why don't we move on to planning and modeling. We are developing some plans in QGIS, uh, well, all of them, but at the moment we have a few to show here. Uh, so this, starting with the burn planning, we've got this section here that we want to burn more frequently than the surrounding woodlands to promote more grassy vegetation in here over uh, woody vegetation. So we've got the unit specified. We know where we can put in our fire breaks where we need to put them in. We've got the road up here, and we've got the water down here, and we put the fire breaks here so we've got some contingencies. We can use our points, a point layer for alpha, Bravo and Charlie in our safety zone, so we can communicate on the fire line about locations of people and fires. Uh, and we've got our prescribed winds direction. Um, we can turn on the land fire layer to show some uh, topography for our ignition planning. So we can go ahead and put these ignition lines in Let's say we want a heading fire coming up from Bravo upslope. And we're so first thing we do is from Alpha to Charlie, we'll put in a backing fire. And then we'll walk down the fire line. And let's put in another uh, fire line here a long contour so we can get a nice big black area at the top of this hill. And this is uh, the opposite direction, Charlie to Alpha, and it's going to be a strip heading fire. Um, and then we want to put that final heading fire at uh, Point Bravo down there, so we'll end up walking down this fire line and putting in a really short 
fire line here. And we can use the field generator, excuse me, the field calculator to generate automatic lengths of those fire lines. Um, and then we can actually print this chart out for our crew so that everybody knows where the fire is going to be. And uh, we can actually even have this on our map that everybody gets so people know what's going on and where. In our planning as well, we run vSmoke models in and import the modeling results into QGIS so that we know where the smoke is going to go, how severe it's going to be, and um, you know adjust our prescriptions accordingly. Some of our work is going to be in and around sensitive sites. So a good example to start with here is our, along our streams. Uh, when we're working along the streams, we're going to be inside of what's called streamside management zones, and we want to demark them on our maps. So I'm going to update Cruise Creek and these western perennial tributaries with just a simple buffer off of this reprojection layer. So we do a geoprocessing buffer. This layer is reprojected in a localized coordinate reference system, so we can enter it, the buffer by feet, make it round. And um, those buffers are based on slope. So we do have slope displayed so that we can make sure that we are demarking those buffers at the proper distances from those stream banks. And we can take uh, those shapes that were generated um, and copy them and just move them into the SMZ layer that we already have to update it like that. Now that we have the SMZ zones, we can update them for our work crews so they'll know where those demarcations are and they can adjust the best practices accordingly. We also have some at-risk species and we want to be careful when we're working around those, right? So we can use our vegetation survey or our naturalist data to uh, extract by attribute. And we'll use Georgia Aster as an example if we're working in an area where Georgia Aster exists in uh, population. We want to show where those areas are cleanly and neatly without a lot of clutter. We can just go ahead and extract only those. And we'll just um, display only those on our work plans and so in the area where we have Georgia Aster here we can we can even build a buffer off of these to make sure that whoever's doing the work there is careful with their machines or their steers or whatever they're working with out there to protect those at-risk species and another example is like erodibility of soils we want to make sure that our soils are uh, being protected. And so we have uh, displayed here our on road erod erosion hazard. So when we're maintaining or building new logging roads, we can adjust those turnouts based on whether the soils are moderate rating for erosion hazard or low rating for erosion hazard or what have you. We can put these maps on the work orders. And Protect our soils, protect our waters, protect our at-risk species and other sensitive sites that might present themselves with uh, some of these tools in QGIS. So we'll be doing a lot of that and um, you can be very particular. So we'll move on. And for doing evaluations and reviews so that you can change your plans for the future, uh, was pretty similar to analyzing some of the baseline data. So you might be, uh, for example, uh, continuing to monitor these pawpaw trees 
and uh, you know there'll be more fields to fill out based on the date and maybe its condition um, that we're monitoring. Um, you know our vegetation surveys have a lot of data that we'll be evaluating uh, and we'll know what we did, where we did it because of our our plans and our uh, works uh, our work orders so we can overlay those plans and work orders and records uh, with some of the evaluation data that we collect um, so you know as an example we have uh, this woody stem data and if we open the attribute table there are a lot of stem tallies in here that will no doubt change uh, based on the basal area mechanical treatments and the burning that we'll be doing. We have uh, DBH classes for saplings, uh, seedlings, and as well as uh, trees. So we've got our seedling classes, sapling classes, tree classes, and uh, we can monitor this data based on those plot points and uh, continue to monitor them and compare that data side by side with the baseline data as we as we go on as part of our evaluation and review process. Same thing for you know uh, burn evaluations. You know how did this burn go? Well, we'll do an evaluation chart, and that will be data that we can compare side by side with our plans and our. Uh, evaluations and then we'll be able to adjust those future plans so that about sums it up uh, you know there, there's a lot going on here in our QGIS map and there'll be even more as we go along but uh, itself, organize all this data analyze all this data and generate uh, presentation maps and videos like this one for uh, potentially really specific objectives and goals, uh, as well as general information. So that sums it up. I uh, appreciate y'all's time. This is uh, your boy Slim here, signing out. Have a good day, y'all.